Hey, it's Jerry at the Fledge. Welcome to another episode of Every Damn Day. And today we have on the show our very good friend, Mr. Daryl. How are you today, Daryl? Doing good, Jerry. How are you? How's uh, all your rest? I'm doing really well. Um, how's all your rest going? I know you're on vacation. Yep, I'm resting up, uh, just taking it easy, uh, collecting my thoughts, uh, preparing for January 12th. Uh, I finished my bachelor's of science and IT online. Need about 18 credits. So you'll be you starting on January 12th or you're finished on January 12th? No, I start on January 12th. Oh, sweet. When do you think you'll be done? Are uh, you gonna try? Go it's, about, uh, it's about a year worth for the 18 All right. credits. Sweet. I didn't know that. That's a nice little surprise. I didn't know you were working on that st- or again. Um, So why don't you tell us about Daryl and tell us about some of the projects that you have? Um, Well, I was born in Muskegon, Michigan. I got raised in Muskegon in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, When I was like 18, I ended up uh, going to prison for like 20 years. I was in street gangs, selling drugs, robbing people, whatever. So I'm a convicted felon. Um, when I got out in 2012, June 6th, I got out with the mindset of I can't let that be a crutch. So um, I started pursuing entrepreneurialism, uh, furthering my education. At that age, when I got out, I didn't want to be the older guy just working a minimum wage job and not having no other skill sets. So it was very important. I spoke with several family members and so, hey, let me get some education. Let me get some better skills. And definitely um, a lot of people in my age bracket had worked for that 20 years. So they had pensions and you know, they could retire. Um, I didn't want to work for another 25, 30 years for somebody talking about a pension on minimum wage. So I definitely uh, pursue entrepreneurialism. And uh, the learning curve has been sharp, but uh, it has been very rewarding. Yeah, I I'm I'm so impressed with you. Um not as a convicted felon, but as an entrepreneur. Um I mean, we were talking about how you've pivoted um innovative interactions this year before we came on the show and we'll talk more about that. Um but what you have done in your entrepreneurial journey since I've known you, but even before that has been amazing to me. Um because well, actually, I'm going to let you tell it and we'll see why. Um, but when when you were still in prison, you were taking a lot of classes, right? Yes. So, um, yeah. A good friend of mine who's an author, uh, Shaka Senghor, um, we were at a facility, uh, Adrian Correctional Facility. And um, one of the big issues there was lack of programming. So we spoke with like the deputy warden's administrative assistant. And he was like, well, the reason you don't have programming here is because don't nobody asked for it. He was like, what? So we started asking for stuff. They started approving stuff. So um, we started uh, business classes, um, uh, just simple classes. Like if you want to get out and do T-shirts, uh, a lot of people in prison acquire artistic skills and whatever. Um, and everything basically we asked for, they said, well, as long as you got somebody to moderate it, that's cool. And uh, it's on you to get your own curriculum and material, which I have family support. So uh, that was beautiful. Also uh, ran across a guy, Tom Adams out of Detroit. He had a program called Chance for Life. And uh, I was one of the individuals chose to be a moderator in that. So we had to take a class on uh, a year long class on how to be facilitators and moderators for these basic uh, cognitive behavioral uh techniques that need to be implemented and um that turned out well and i learned a lot from that and i brought that out of prison with me and um went down to northwest initiative uh where monica jenner is at so everybody coming out of jail and prison i was doing conflict resolution for like six years and it's very very beneficial because if we don't change our thought process then that's going to stagnate us as we try to proceed on doing anything else in life 
and changing my thought process from being a criminal, from being the, uh, well, I'm the black guy that everybody out to get me or against me. Changing that thought process really helped me be successful in what I'm doing now. Yeah. It's, uh, so would you mind, like, uh, let's talk about how you and I met because you are, if we started with any companies that we were trying to help, you were one of the first two or three, uh, for sure. And I didn't know what I was doing back then, but I knew how to start some businesses and you and I hit it off very quickly. Yep. Um, I was going to a mobile Monday event out at MSU technology and innovation center. You was a guest speaker for that. And, uh, then my, uh, former business partner was my classmate in school. Uh, we were going for it network administration and you met us and, uh, you was like, uh, okay, you guys in the it. And we were like, yeah. And, uh, my, a uh, former business partner was working for a school system and you said, you know, you was really interested in helping the kids uh, focus on learning different things about IT and that integration into the school systems. And uh, after that, I reached out to you and you told me about the Fledge, which was uh, previously located in Grand Ledge. And I came out there. I was like, wow, whole different just environment. Everybody here uh, has a trait, a skill set, trying to do something positive. So um, from there, we start networking and plugging in and, and doing different stuff. And although uh, me and my former business partner did have a business, um, you start mentoring me in the different ways of businesses. So you got like your DBAs, your LLCs, your C Corps, your S Corps, and uh, ultimately uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, you did trick me into doing a pitch competition. <laughs> <laughs> and how'd that go? I enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, it allowed a few things. One, for me to experience the entrepreneurialism, although I, I do own an IT company, uh, Innovative Interaction LLC is a, a touchscreen media company. And um, that allowed me to take another journey and learn so much more in the entrepreneurialism industry and uh, doing the pitch competition, networking. Uh, before we left, we had a contract. So that, that yeah. turned out real good. Yeah, one of my uh, favorite signs that I wrote this year, um, but probably won't be yours, was uh, don't touch the touch screen. <laughs> <laughs> And that just, I saw that after I wrote it and put it up, I was like, this is just, that's my quote for 2020. Don't yeah. touch the touch screen. <laughs> so, you know, I want to go back in, in the beginning of when we met, um, you had a job. Um, yeah. Cause that, I think, was that a requirement at that time of parole or were you off parole by then? I can't remember. No. Um, so having a job, or pursuing education is requirements for parole. I had a two year parole and um, some of the things I was doing was because I got out and at my age, which I won't reveal right now, um, <laughs> I just found it hard to find a job better than minimum wage. I, I turned in over 200 job applications and it was either, I don't have the right skill sets or I'm overqualified and I was like, how am I overqualified with a GED at 40 years old? That was crazy. So I ended up working at Wendy's and a uh, minimum wage. And I worked there all through school for my associates in IT. I do have a, a degree already. And um, that right there, that took me through a whole bunch of self-realization of I want to pursue entrepreneurialism. I felt that the minimum wage and hours I was working, I can go out and have my own stuff and get twice that amount of money. It was not a path that I was willing to stay on being, you know, we had employees there nine, 10 years. And the only raises you get is because they increased minimum wage. Um, even their managers, managers only making 10 or $11 an hour. And they thought that was money. I was like, wow. Yeah. So, you know, in the old Grand Le in the Grand Ledge Fledge, we had that red hallway and it said every damn day, sponsor yourself. 
Yes. And that was originally, you know, towards skateboarders um, when we first came up with that sponsor yourself phrase. But you really epitomized it with not wanting to, <laughs> I still say po potato heads all the time. Yeah. Um, um, not wanting to work like that anymore and saying, all right, I can't get these other jobs. I'm going to create my own job and I'm going to do it myself. And, you know, that journey, it, it's been rough sometimes, but you have done such a great job at it and gained the strengths to understand your business. Do you mind telling the story of how you've pivoted Innovative Interactions in the year of Don't Touch the Touchscreen? Yes. So when COVID hit, um, we had already had some contracts and uh, COVID killed all the contracts. And that was real, uh, very, very just painful. And so I was sitting here and I said, uh, I got a job and I work for a guy and he specializes in e-commerce. So I spoke with him and uh, I said, you know, I learned I got other business mentors, but you doing e-commerce and this is what surviving and this is what the world is going to everybody standing at home uh right now on my street i live on every week you see so many amazon prime vans and ups vans everybody ordering online so i start researching and said hey i could sit here and say innovative interactions got shut down because of covid but that's not me determination self-determination kuji jacalia self second principle of kwanzaa um i looked into it uh, I did a pivot and I learned about the pivot from you uh, when you spoke on it uh, at the mobile Monday, you were saying that, you know, instead of just going on a downward spiral and crashing with the business, you got to seize an opportunity to pivot your company so that it can stabilize and, and start growing again. So that's what I did. I looked into the uh, Michigan resales tax certificate and becoming a, a certified reseller of things. So um, I pivoted that and got that uh, certificate. And then I started uh, applying to auction sites online. And I also started buying from uh, my current employer who uh, flipped pallets and things like that. So my first batch of things I bought was like mowers and uh, chainsaws and weed whips and stuff like that. And they sold in the summertime. So I, I was able to flip it. Um, then I started looking into e-commerce. Um, the Fledge had won a eBay a store for like a year, but at the time, because COVID hadn't happened, I really didn't uh, grasp the interest. But because of COVID happened, I was forced into learning a lot of the aspects of e-commerce. And e-commerce has been great. Um, from a small business perspective, uh, a lot of fledglings have businesses and have websites and uh, they sell products, you know, on their website. Well, um, I think, well, we got to back up because the Fledge is also a uh, host to the Lansing WordPress meetup group. So mm -hmm. I am, I do have a skill set. I'm one of the four core co-organizers and uh, we do websites. So what we learned from the website thing is you don't got foot traffic. Um, people don't see your website just because you got a URL and got a nice fancy page. If your product is not out there, it's not receiving the type of uh, people looking at it and going to where is that? They never know about it and you never make a sale or you might get one or two sales. So I learned a lot in that in e-commerce It's people literally don't have websites. All they have is an eBay account or a Facebook marketplace mm -hmm. account. And they sell thousands of dollars of stuff every week without a website. So that yeah. is very, very intricate. So when you, so before COVID, you're, you've got this touch screen technology where, you know, those events that got canceled for you got canceled for me too, but we picked them up virtual later. So that was good. Um, and, so now you've pivoted and you're you're flipping different things that some of it has nothing to do with touch screen. Some of it's still in that electronics realm. What happens when COVID starts to go away to innovative interactions? Will you pivot back? 
Well, I have a couple options. So in the pivot, I had to, I have uh, three minority co-owners of Innovative Interactions LLC. And uh, I've been showing them how the e-commerce works so we can actually fork and grow. We can go back to doing the touch screens, acquiring clients, and we can also hold on to generating additional income on the e-commerce platform. Mm -hmm. You know, that here's why I think this is genius. If you don't mind me calling you a genius, <laughs> um, the, uh, the pivot makes you resilient, saves your company. You know, like we pivoted from all this entrepreneurial support to just get, get out there distributing food, stay essential, stay important, stay relevant. And so you, you took that resiliency path, you kept the business alive and not just learning about e-commerce, but when you go back into the touchscreen, that's where you were getting a lot of them anyway, right? Yes. You were you were buying them off from uh, the different sites, bidding on them, fixing yeah. them up, and that's your product. Now you're going to be even better at that. And then the ability to just resell those and flip those and know when to do that, you're going to be amazing. You're, you're going to come out so strong. And it's going to turn out that COVID was so good to innovative interactions, even though it felt so bad when it started happening. Yes. And that, that strategy of I'm not going to use any crutches, I'm paraphrasing what you said, but it's tremendous. I mean, you're coming out so much stronger and in such a great position right now. It's uh, I'm so proud of you, Daryl, <laughs> if you don't mind me. Um, so let's uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about 2020 and COVID and uh, George Floyd gets killed in May. Breonna Taylor before that. Um, the racial tension is, you know, as high as I've seen it in a long, long time. And um, the Black Lives Movement more, or Black Lives Matter movement is, uh, you know, growing very fast and getting more and more powerful. And prison reform is being talked about left and right. You know what? What's been on your mind? Because since I've known you, you are a kind and gentle man, and I, I would be scared to ever make you mad. Um, but you have always been very peaceful but also kind of, uh, I, I don't know, your view on things is so insightful. What's well, been going on in your head in 2020? A couple of things. Uh, one, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the emotional things attached to the current movements are uh, basically coming from the millennial aspect. I grew up through those things, uh, even those before me, I have uh, older siblings, uncles, aunts, grew up in the 60s, the civil rights marches, um, I'm very well aware of them. I think the main thing that irks me is uh, the exclusion thing. People uh, exclude me from those, although I am a African-American male sitting here in these times, in these conditions, in these situations, they say, oh, you're doing all right. You got a college degree. You're doing good after prison. Um, You got a business. And they act like it don't apply to me. But it does apply to me. I went to prison for being in a street gang. Um, I've seen plenty of racism. I still see racism. Uh, things like uh, I had a talk with a group of uh, people in the forum where we were talking about, well, the people wanted marijuana legalized. So they petitioned and walked out and got all those signatures. Now, when it comes to criminal justice reform, Black Lives Matters, the power is in the people constitutionally. I still yet have to see someone come to my door to ask me to sign to put something on a voting ballot for the people dealing with these social issues. True, we can get legislative help, um, maybe a congressman or a senator to introduce a bill. But when that marijuana was getting legalized, every two, three days, I had somebody come and ask me, how do I feel about it? And will I sign a petition so they get the signatures? And for these social causes that's going on right now, I no one has walked up down the street asking for a signature. And that exclusion thing, 
I'm just like, wow, you know, <laughs> I've had a long journey and um, I'm not excluded from anything. And I get reminded of it periodically. Uh, I walk in, you, you just said it where, you know, okay, I don't want to tick you off. And I have people, I'm, I'm six foot three and a half, 250 <laughs> pounds. And they see me, they see the scruffy beard and they be like, oh man, a, a thug, a, a, a black guy. I got on right now, I got on a hoodie and a, a skull cap. So, you know, people have those stereotypes until they speak to me. When they speak to me, I'm articulate. Uh, I have a, a nice little eight year. I tell everybody, you know, right now I'm only eight and a half years old. <laughs> <laughs> that Yeah. June 6th, I'll be nine years old out in this society. Um, when I got out, I didn't know what a smartphone was. I didn't know what Wi-Fi was. I didn't know what the internet was. I didn't even know what IT stood for. So um, the journey has been very, very sharp on the learning curve into integrating all these things to make myself relevant, as you say. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of my phrases I use is proper preparation prevents poor performance. So um, I try to always stay ready so I don't have to get ready. I try to prepare myself for all types of things that may happen. And just keeping that in mind when I wake up every day, uh, I make it through most days pretty successful. I, uh, I'm going to go back to why I wouldn't mess with you. I saw you lift this big ass 70 inch TV by yourself <laughs> and put it up on a, a rack. So, uh, yeah. Um, do you think that because you're so resilient and you're, you're so able to pivot that people look at you and think that you must've had a lucky break, you must've had something like that. Do you think it's your strength that makes them feel that? Is that what you're basically saying? Um, I'm not for certain. I do know that a lot of people I interact with have a certain sense about me. I don't know uh, in like in cognitive behavior, uh, you learn to be I used to be aggressive, just aggressive, zero understanding, uh, zero emotions, whatever. And I just was reacting. I wasn't I wasn't just responding. I was reacting. And a lot of those triggers was based off of how I got raised, what my belief system was and what my experience was. So uh, now. When people say, hey, I feel this certain type of way, some of them mistake aggressiveness from being assertive. And I'm in I'm in assertive mode. Everything I do is is structural, positive. Uh, I don't do negative things. Um, I'm a, well aware that I can be negative, but I try hard not to be negative. Uh, when I'm at the FLED, I try to conduct myself in a positive and professional manner at all times. Um, if I can help someone, I help them. Um, I try to I also with these traits, I learned that a lot of people will take advantage of people as well. So I, I shy away from people trying to take advantage of me. So um, their, their viewpoint on how they perceive me uh it matters and i try to identify that as quickly as possible when interacting with people or interacting with new people so that we can have an even playing field of i'm here to help you and if you can possibly help me we can uh share reciprocal skills techniques or uh, skill sets and go on from there yeah and i do want to mention and thank you you have been integral to the backbone of the it at the fledge both in grand ledge and um in lansing and shout out to jeremy too who's also been integral in that um he uh him and uh carol are both here uh, yep. so uh you might want to say hi to your friends there jeremy hey carol um so how how would you sum up what your mission is? Because I'm sure you've got a mission for innovative interactions. I'm sure you've got a mission for the work that you're doing with Kelly. Um, but what's wh how would you sum up what your mission is, what, what you do every damn day to push that mission forward? Uh, my mission to sum it up would be to... I wake up and try to be a better version of myself than I was yesterday. 
and try to be a, a better version and a, a better constituent and friend to those that uh, I surround myself with as a support system every day. If uh, I wake up and Carol had a bad yesterday, I want to be able to give her some advice or some, some support to say, hey, let's move on. Uh, here's some tools to deal with it. Same thing with Jeremy. So all those around me, uh, I want them to be successful and achieve any type of goal they want. Um, definitely some of the things that push me is not having to work for the next 40 years for someone, um, not waking up worrying about can I pay this bill or that bill, being able to see residual income come in, and definitely before I'm 55, have a, a secure and sound business that's generating enough income to take care of me and those around me that's in, in this business. Yeah, you just, uh, all of that's amazing advice. And one of the gems that I think you just said is one of my favorite things, um, one about you, but one about successful businesses is they create symbiotic relationships. So, yeah. and you're always looking for what value are you adding and not focused on what value can they give to me? Because right. if you if you do that, take that first approach, you're in control, you're driving, you can get that value by providing value. And it's it's, it's just, you're so insightful when it comes to stuff like that. I want to put a comment up, uh, Michael, Michael Cor ah, I just remember, or just found out I can't pronounce your name, Michael, um, Coulter. Um, but he's just saying we have a uh, very intriguing entrepreneurial souls. And I definitely agree with that. So bravo to Daryl too. And Michael, we're going to get you on the show soon. I promise. Um, so yesterday on the show, we had uh, a friend of yours, but I didn't know that. I didn't know you knew this person and you didn't know that she was on the show, but right. we had Heather Taylor, who is her partner, and we had uh, Shepherdess, so second show I've said that word, um, Kendra Milton, and you met her at Northwest Initiative. Correct. And, you know, the, uh, uh, Heather was talking about she's kind of fasc fascinated with the leather letter P yeah. and she said a few things, but she said that uh, what what is it again? The five P's or the six Pro proper preparation prevents poor performance. All right. So uh, they have a question for you and I they had a couple questions, but this is the one that we decided to ask you. OK, they said that your father was a pastor. Is that right? Yes, uh, my biological father is a pastor, and um, he he still resides in Muskegon, and um, he does music. And so our connection, well, in my journey of growth, um, I was in prison, and he sent me a letter. And he said, uh, would it be all right for me to come up and visit you and talk to you? I was like, yeah. So we came, uh, I sent him the forms, he sent it back, got approved, he came up there, and that were that's where ground zero happened in growth of a man um and what i mean by that i see a lot of uh reality shows paternity shows and and children saying hey you were never there for me and i hate you and blah 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 none of that happened so um in our initial visit we we started from ground zero and said hey we both grown men and to be a grown man, you got to have certain characteristics that makes you a man. And so we started from there and that built into the current friendship we have as grown men and as a, a father and a son. And that's not to take away from my stepdad who raised me because he gave me beautiful Tracy and still things like pursue your education and always be respectful of those around you, your elders and women and things like that. So now I have two beautiful grown men in my life that uh, gives me mentorship, influence, advice. And that's wonderful. That's uh, as you were talking you know, Marcel at about 6 a.m. this morning sends me a screenshot of uh, Gil Scott Heron's Pieces of a Man. And he's <laughs> like, I just learned about Gil Scott Heron, I think is what he texted. And yeah. you must have put him onto it last night. Um, hey, I've imparted a lot of 
music stuff to Marcel. Yeah. But I've been trying to tell them all, you got to listen to Gil Scott Heron. You got to listen to Gil Scott Heron. They don't listen to me, but they listen to you. <laughs> right? Well. Uh, but I think that's good because I, I don't have that credibility that you have. And as you were talking about the mentoring and the beautiful men in your life, I'm just thinking how lucky Marcel is to have someone like you to learn from and to listen to and to quit doing potatoes <laughs> stuff. <Yeah. laughs> so uh, you do a lot more than run companies. You help us with our IT. You mentor young men around here. You show a positive example. Um, I can never, I mean, I, I, if I was like this, I'd be telling stories about you every day because everything about you has been positive, you know? Um, so you're amazing, Daryl. So their question for you, though, <laughs> which is silly compared to everything we're talking about, is they always meet uh, pastors and pastors' children yeah. that are wearing some sort of fun socks. <laughs> so, so that's what uh, uh, Kendra wanted me to ask you. Do you wear fun socks all the time? Absolutely not. I have <laughs> A whole slew of plain black socks and white socks, and and most of them are ankle socks, except for my winter socks to help keep my feet warm. Um, I never knew that was a trendy thing, but I learned something <laughs> new every day. So I didn't think you uh, you've never showed me your socks before, so I didn't think that your answer was going to be, yeah, I've got goofy socks on right now. <laughs> so tomorrow on the show, and we forgot to figure out this question. But I've got uh, Lakeisha, and she uh, she uh, owns a company, Grace in a Case, and I've never met her before, so I don't know much about her. Right. Um, and what we want to do is pass a question down to her. Oh. What question would you like to pass to her? Um, from who influenced her to proceed with Grace in a Case, what type of a crowd or what type of people do she want to influence? And I'm going to turn that right back on you. What uh, would you like to, what type of people would you like to influence? So the same question you just asked her. All right. Um, I'm asking you. The, the people that influenced me were the people that were the type of individuals that say, Hey, my life isn't perfect. I'm not perfect where can I be a better version of myself? And those people proceed to try to make themselves a better version of themselves every day. So the people I want to influence is those people that are trying. Um, if, if you notice just about anybody that's trying to better themselves, if I can assist them somewhere along their journey or their path, I'm all for it. As uh, soon as people get on the uh, pity party modes, as soon as people get on making tons of excuses like no one else has any issues in their real lives, then that's when I have to distance myself from them because that's toxic and it's, it takes a strain on you trying to help someone that don't want to help themselves, that want to hand me out, uh, that want everybody just gather around and, and, and comfort them. And in situations that may be needed, but if a person hasn't reached that rock bottom or is in that own self-realization that I need to take command, I need to be active towards what I'm doing to pursue whatever dreams I have, then nothing else outside of themselves will be helpful. We see people hit the lottery. We see uh, multimillionaire sports people are broke now because they ran across those scenarios and then have no self-realization and there's no way in heck you can have you can win a 300 million dollar lottery and be broke before you die unless you just a completely not self-realized individual that's that's just insane it is insane um <laughs> it but anyways it happens right yeah so typically i would start to wrap up and end the show here but I'm realizing we didn't talk about music and I think we should. Yeah. Um, so one of the ways that you're able 
to reach Marcel mm -hmm. is through music. Yes. The other way is though you are influencing him in his coding that he's taken on uh, recently as well. So he's got two great things happening and a great mentor to help guide him. And let's explore your music a little bit because would you say you finished your second to the last song for your second album? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on my second album. So my music, music has always been a part of my family growing up. Uh, from siblings to aunts, uncles. Uh, I got a large family uh, that been in bands and played music and things. So in my younger days, I did rapping. And uh, as I was going through prison, I didn't rap. I evolved into doing spoken word. And then I got out and I said, you know what? I, I like jazz because there's nothing in the American English vocabulary that hasn't been said. There's not too many metaphors that hasn't been used. So um, while I was on my two year parole period, I had to catch up on the music world. I left everything was analog, mixing boards and uh, Technique 1200 DJ tables and just a beat machine. And I got out to BSTs and DAWs and Logic and, and Pro Tools. And I was like, wow. And I just barely know how to turn on the computer. So um, in that journey, that two-year journey, um, I learned YouTube tons of stuff. And I learned a, a couple of different DAWs and what BSTs was. And uh, through me just doing regular hustle things like making PowerPoints and stuff, Saved up money, bought me a studio, got a home studio, uh, helped get some of the equipment at the Fledge. And um, I do music. I did an album that I put out in 2016 called Divinity. Um, it got a couple of different people on it. One is uh, my biological father, Jimmy Clark. Um, another one was this 16-year-old Cameron Potter. Um, he worked at Wendy's with me. And um, he's on a song. He played the piano. And uh, now I'm on to my second album. And my first album, although I still get, I get plays is out digitally on everything, Spotify, iTunes. Um, my second album, I really want to uh, try to promote and push. And I do a, a genre called hip hop jazz. So um, all my beats are, are moving and banging. Um, and then I include the jazz element that is something you can just like turn on in the back and, and relax to it and just let it, you know, set the ethers around you. So, uh, you know, we, we have values, not rules at the fledge. We, we really try to stick with that. But one of the, the closest things to a rule that we had here was no more beats being downloaded from YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> man. And, you know, that has been inspiring to people. I mean, you really brought that in like, these guys are all downloading the same damn beat off from right. YouTube and swearing and calling women this and talking about shit they'd never done before. That always drove you. Crazy. I'm not going to say, <laughs> yeah, I'll let you say it. I, uh, I, I've came in there, group of uh, young males in there, black, white, Latino, and I put money out and say, hey, here, here, here's $20. Anybody give me 16 bars of, of a clean flow. And so many times nobody can give me 16 bars of a clean flow. And then I go into, you know, if your vocabulary only consists of four letter words or derogatory words, then that shows, you know, what you're about. If you're going to be metaphoric, take me to a place where I got to think about what he just said made sense and it's relevant um when you go in there and say you know uh it's a difference be between being a performer or an entertainer versus a musician now where marcel play with the keyboard um he played he's doing the bass or the guitar right now he's forming into a musician he's going to learn music theory and be able to integrate itself across any genre um people like matt waterman he plays multiple instruments um, those, those are musicians and that's where you can embody that musical essence when you go to create something. Creativity, whether it's music, art, entrepreneurialism, if you have creativity, you got to find what avenues you're going to travel alone so that people can say, hey, I like that creativity and I can gravitate towards that person.
And so music for me, uh, when it got into, uh, they got genres like mumble rap. I'm like, mumble rap? <laughs> <laughs> you just mumbling? You're not really saying anything? So, um, but definitely uh, the jazz, hip, the hip hop jazz genre, uh, I'm trying to get into that. Um, it's a couple of artists out there that like do jazz covers to uh, real popular songs. I even did one. Um, but you know, I like creating my own stuff. Yeah. So. Well, my dream is for Marcel to make a set of beats using real instruments. Like we've always dreamed about that, you know, to have that, that guy using a guitar instead of the guitar button on garage band or whatever. Right. And then my son rain, uh, spitting on top of them. All right. So I'm, uh, I'm trying to work towards that. So we need to get Marcel to look at Prince. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get Prince, he, he, uh, he did a couple of shows where he went through the uh, whole set and hopped on each instrument. Uh, another one, a local one, Kid Rock. Kid Rock plays a lot of different instruments and in, in his shows, uh, he'll go through and get on the drums, get on the guitar, get on the piano. And, uh, that's just that's wonderful when you see a person can express themselves over multiple instruments and and have a, a song that's nice. Yeah, Kid Rock's on our shit list though, but that's a different story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna start to end, and I just wanna from our good friend Jeremy. You know, you made a hell of an impact with your approach to learning and putting in all that extra hours paid off in a big way. And I do think that the skill set that you bring to the table, both for us and for yourself, is uh, what's made you resilient and strong and pivoting. And, you know, it's it's uh, resilience comes from the traits that you have, right. um, not from grants that you get from the city or whatever. Right. You know, that's resiliency. You're the epitome of it. And, and let me ahead. add one thing. Ironically, uh, Jeremy is one of my uh, business partners in Innovative Interactions, LLC. But he also used to be uh, my instructor in my IT path when I went to Career Quest. Um, he, he, was, he was challenging me along the way at every corner. And uh, I excelled through that. Even though it's an accelerated course, I excelled through the acceleration. Because I really, I was really into IT, and I'm still really into IT. So we do uh, projects, and um, anytime when you go into the workforce and you say, "Hey, do we got any black guys in IT?" Yes, you do. Uh, when you go into the workforce and say, "Hey, you know, is anybody doing this?" Yes, we do. And just on a side note, IT. Uh, a lot of people think IT is basically coding. And they don't understand anything on the internet, internet, anything, websites, uh, network administration, your router, Wi-Fi, home automation, internet of things, all that is covered in IT. So I don't I see a lot of fledglings. Uh, I tell them I'm in IT and they kind of look like, well, I needed somebody to fix my computer. And me and Jeremy and some classmates, we ran like two years free uh, computer clinics at career quest and we fix tons of computers so uh that's just to reach out and cover that all right <laughs> so um what would you like to take us out with uh i would like to take you out with uh in 2021 wake up every damn day and say what do i need to do to be a better version of myself than i was yesterday wake up every day and say hey those around me that's close to me how can i enrich their lives and help them be a better version of themselves and most importantly listen if you don't listen then you'll never hear anything god gave you two ears and one mouth so you listen twice as much as you speak i love it you never learn anything when your mouth is open that's for damn sure <laughs> Hey, man, I can't wait for COVID to be over. We miss you around here. You know, I know you do a lot of virtual stuff with us, um, but we sure do miss seeing you. 
and I can't wait till it's over. You're going to be too damn busy for us, too big for us, all Never. that stuff. Never. But you're a great man, and I really appreciate our friendship, and I really uh, appreciate, you know, it might have started out me mentoring you, but you mentor me. It's always symbiotic with you and I, and uh, I'm just so proud to know you, Daryl. Thank you. Proud to know you, too. Thanks for coming on the show. Yep, you're welcome. All right, everyone, I will see you later. Stay tuned tomorrow for another, or come in tomorrow for another every damn day. We're out. Peace.